to introduce those professionals. First of all, Daniel Ogo from INRIA. Please. Thank you. I think a lot of people know INRIA. It's a center of research well known in France and they worked on research on AI, but also in blockchain. Am I right? Uh, you have yours. Okay. <laughs> no, you're not right. Uh, I am working on, block on he, blockchain and crypto, but not a lot of people at INRIA. Okay, great. Stéphanie Flaché, please, from Langan. Really interesting company, and uh, they are able to, to show you your, their solution because they are also exhibitors. Thank you, Stephanie, to be here. Frank Devigne, <laughs> founding partners of True Global Capital. So basically, his work is to identify sustainable companies to invest into with equities, if I, if I'm I right. Perhaps one day in crypto directly, I just push this message for you. <laughs> and. Arnaud de la Chapelle, please. <laughs> which is a board member of Deep Square, which is uh, um, HPC as a service based on blockchain technology. You need computational power. You can request it on demand without necessity to own your own infrastructure. And we know how AI will need this kind of powerful solution. I will start first with you to understand exactly where are we going. But I think we speak really um, important matters about AI, but the question is, could you please explain just really quickly, efficiently, what is an AI or what is not an AI? Because sometimes we have chatbots, but we think it's an AI and it's not an AI. Do you think that we can just explain what is AI? Who wants to take the mic first to explain it? Arno? Or maybe I can try explain both blockchain and AI for, oh, okay. for us. Wonderful. It's, there are two things which are totally symbiotic. Uh, because blockchain is about trust. Uh, you know that better than I do. It's about trust in data, trust in uh, data integrity. Um, and AI is about intelligence. It's to make this data intelligent and to help it becoming predictive. So uh, AI is feeds on data, and data is what gets out of the blockchain. So, so I think that's why I was very in interested in participating to this blockchain AI panel. So let, uh, let's let's the Inria explain. Well explained. Yeah, just here. Marche pas? Yes, it's working. So in Ria, my institute, so it's the so I and A stands for informatic and automatic, and not at all for intelligence artificial. So it was funded in the 60s, so don't be confused with that. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, artificial intelligence that in Ria. I'm not doing an, an artificial intelligence, I'm doing cryptography. You prefer you love blockchain instead of AI? Uh, even more than blockchain, I love cryptography. <laughs> uh, I know a little bit uh, about, uh, you know, um, electronic signature, hash function, elliptic curves, zero knowledge. We spoke uh, about cryptography, uh, yes. Homomorphic encryption and so on. So what can I say about AI? So actually I had a PhD student doing a mixture of uh, crypto and AI, and uh, he was doing very simple AI because when you, well, cryptography, not crypto blockchain, okay, cryptography. Yeah, yeah the cryptography. <laughs> okay. And so you have, indeed you have data, you train um, a so-called model on the data, and then you get, uh, let's say, a huge matrix or something like this, you, where you have a model, and then you use the model on new data to get predictions. Uh, this is all I know about AI, so I'm just very explicit about it. <laughs> and uh, the larger the model, the better the, the prediction, so this is why you are thinking about uh, HPC, but actually there is also a trend to have uh, AI in very small devices, uh, to have your personal AI, because maybe you don't need a lot of data just for you. I already love this panel because we come from different uh, world and industries. Just to mention, I'm uh, in the blockchain industry since eight years around, but before that, I'm a perfect banker. I spent 20 years in the banking industry. And with this mindset, for me, the, the, the symbiotic uh, correlation between AI, blockchain, and IoT is that we entered the data economy. And I'm convinced that Web3 is first and above all about data economy. Industrial economy is over. I know that we should not say that like that, but it's over. We have entered the data economy. And basically, 
AI, IoT, blockchain are tools that permit to, permit to process in the, in the data economy. Regarding blockchain in particular, I'm more expert if I can say that in blockchain, uh, my interest in blockchain was not really on trust, although I'm from the trustworthy industry, but for me, uh, the revolution of blockchain is in the granularity of information. The fact that with a token or a hash, we, have, we can trace the information at the user and transaction level. And believe me, this is a revolution because today banks are monitoring the economy only with figures. But figures linked to the economic understanding, it is a problem. It's also the problem in companies with ERP. And that's what blockchain solves. And blockchain th that traces information, AI helps us to understand, uh, IoT uh, tracks information. So this is perfect combo. And we have no choice. You mentioned this morning why I believe in Web3. I believe in Web3 because we have no choice. But there are some issues in terms of adoption, security, and so on, but we'll go through it. Wow, there is a lot of energy for a Saturday, guys. <laughs> Sorry, Do you need a maybe I'll take well, it slowly. It's Saturday, I'm not shopping, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so... <laughs> okay, look, for me, uh, blockchain is a ledger, a shared ledger, a distributed ledger of data that we, at some point, uh, could use and could, uh, for uh, different uh, reasons, one of the uh, first is basically the traceability of things, and I think that's exactly what we are missing in the uh, new era of uh, AI and Gen AI, with those black box of we don't know exactly how those box have been trained uh, with some data, etc. So, by combining both, uh, there is one technology that is solving uh, the, the problems of, of, or the new problems of, uh, uh, of the other one. Uh, so traceability could be interpreted at some point like the uh, best system to track IP uh, rights. So uh, I agree we are entering into a data economy, but also uh, we are enabling with those technologies some new joiners in this data economy that are um, or could be like emerging countries and notably by enabling them to uh, become part of the creator's economy and being paid uh, for that creativity uh, at some point. So um, I'm not going to uh, uh, explain in detail the confidentiality, traceability, security of all the things that could be uh, uh, um, powered by the blockchain, but then on creator's economy, definitely this is one of the key opportunities for a convergence of those both uh, technologi technologies. At True Global Ventures, we are uh, investing in those two technologies, so blockchain and AI is part of our investment thesis, but then we believe in mega uh, trends that we have defined uh, and we used to define uh, mega trends every five years. And some of uh, those uh, mega trends that we defined in 2018 were seeing uh, metaverse and gaming as the first use case for the blockchain. And then what we said beginning of this year, after five years of this mega trend, and we were very right on some and, and very wrong on others, notably AI, um, is that uh, the combination of both is definitely uh, a fantastic opportunity for gaming, which use AI for, uh, from the beginning, uh, which is one of the largest industry uh, of, uh, in the world, like uh, three million, three billion uh, uh, players for 300 billion, uh, 200 to 300 billions of uh, uh, revenues, I would say, generated by the industry, which is um, higher than both combined uh, music, cinema, and uh, uh, entertainment, I would say. And then, um, so if you at some point leverage on, on AI, creativity, uh, and the blockchain, you will have uh, the possibility to accelerate uh, drastically, actually, the, uh, the fact that the metaverse is going to be uh, mainstream. So we invest in metaverse, in gaming, uh, powered uh, notably by AI, and we invest also in many other things. We talk about that a bit later.
So, so Deep Square is exactly at the convergence between AI and the blockchain. So we, we offer a simple, um, secure uh, infrastructure for AI community. And on the other side, we use the blockchain to interconnect all the suppliers with the AI users. So, so we are exactly at the convergence if you have a, a wish to invest. Yeah, we, we had a conversation previously to, the, to that uh, uh, panel discussion where we have invested in a Bitcoin mining uh, company based in Canada, mining Bitcoin on a wasted energy of a hydraulic uh, power station. Uh, I would say uh, with the yeah wasted energy, which which could be a, a business model for the green transition. But indeed, this company is also uh, opening a new uh, activities on uh, HPC and, and providing because uh, at the end it's Nvidia uh, that is uh, uh, allowing this uh, this computing power you, you that we can an switch. Interesting point uh, is about the necessity to have enough computational power for AI. We didn't speak about that because that's the fuel. And do you think now we have enough infrastructure? enough HPC power to provide and provide a good answer to the needs of all of these new companies using AI. What do you think about that? So we don't, we don't. We all know that uh, AWS, Azure, uh, Google uh, Cloud Platform, they are all full and they are refusing space to smaller uh, customers. Uh, they even Microsoft, they ask their own developers not to use Azure so that it can be used for ChatGPT and for uh, teaching uh, GPT-4. So, so um, these guys who are the people selling compute, they don't have resources anymore, but there is plenty of resource. You have people having fantastic data centers, but they don't know how to connect that to the users. They, they you know, when you sell compute, you need to be able to sell by the minute a specific uh, compute and that you need a tool. You need a tool to do that. You need uh, to be part of an aggregated uh, network where everybody putting together the long tail of data centers can bring together enough compute for the AI. And that's exactly what Deep Square is doing. It's to aggregate through the blockchain all the data centers having some capability so that it becomes a player of an order of magnitude of a big uh, hyperscaler. I think it's a really important question because you raise a, a new economy is coming by based on data, and how do we treat this these data? Who is able to get the ownership? And I think it's related also to the cryptography and to the question about privacy. Daniel, do you think that we can manage the ability to preserve the privacy and the ownership of the data by using blockchain technology? Okay, so uh, can you hear me? Yes, it's working. So cryptography, uh, I like to say, it's, you have notions in computer science and in cryptography which are incredible, like zero knowledge. Uh, you should try to understand what is zero knowledge. It's like, you know, uh, general relativity or Gödel theorem. So each discipline has its own strange thing, uh, not intuitive at all. So yes, you can have a public blockchain and privacy at the same time. Uh, it was demonstrated in 16 by the zero cash uh, protocol and cryptocurrency. So essentially, uh, what, are, what is registered in the blockchain is some kind of hash of uh, exchanges between users, but the miners do not see what's going on. But still there is a proof that says that what is going on is correct. So no money creation, no double spending, and so on and so on. So this is so-called a zero knowledge proof. It's a proof that something is correct, but you don't say why. Okay. So that's very important in blockchain, and so there have been huge investment. Uh, there was a blog post from Polygon before the crypto winter. They say they committed $1 billion only on zero knowledge, which is incredible. Uh, so that's one thing. So yes, you can have publicly that blockchain, but the data is not public. So you can have a public blockchain with public miners, decentralized everything but users can act privately on this blockchain. 
That's why this technology is so wonderful. You can update it, you can modulate it, you can use it in a different manners. And uh, thank you for, for this because I think it's really important to understand that with blockchain technology, there is no opposition with confidentiality, with privacy. It's it's possible, and you mentioned zero knowledge proof. Yeah, at the at the contrary, at the contrary, if you're an AI searcher and you want to work on uh, a AWS, for example, uh, the first thing they will ask you is your mail, your address, your ID, your credit card details. So, so that's not privacy, is it? Uh, if you connect to Deep Square, you just need to have a wallet with some credit on it, and the wallet is your identity. Your wallet is your ID, but it's anonymous ID. So, so you're, uh, you can have access to compute power without people knowing who you are, which is quite different from what you have from the hyperscalers. Could be important for competition because we know companies are on the same sectors that need to be competitive. And, and sometimes we don't want to reveal that we are going in this direction. And it could be a precious tool to, to make it. But I'm thinking about the, the way to, to constantly use perhaps the use of the third party services. Do you think that third party services can just confirm what blockchain says? Do you think that we need that in terms of consumer acceptation for the, the AI and blockchain? Or you think that's it's not a question? Stephanie? You come with your question, I come with my answer. <laughs> Wonderful. No, but, but I will answer your question. Um, because you raise indirectly the challenge, which is very, still very important for the mass adoption, of the legal security articulated with the technical security. And at the very beginning of the blockchain revolution, we all thought that technology would be enough, that blockchain uh, is a trust machine. It's true, I mean, technology is great, we can solve a lot of problems, but at, at the end of the day, a trace, even immutable, technically perfect is not a proof. And the issue was how each of us... Proof in terms of legal acceptation. Yes, in terms of legal acceptation. Uh, how can we, how can our fundamental rights can be protected within those technical environments, which are uh, an addition of software, hardware, and so on. So the issue of legal security is very important for the, the, the legal adoption. And uh, teaser, login is a solution, but we'll talk about that uh, later. But the, important, the, very, the very important thing uh, is that we always must be sure that we will be protected by justice. Even if a state, uh, I mean, provide us digital identity with zero knowledge proof and so on, if we have a problem, will we be protected with neutral and independent parties uh, before law and before justice? So That's what you say. We'll always need a third party. I'm independent and neutral, protecting our rights, but we'll, we'll go So in. it means we need to, to train and educate yes. the professional who will use blockchain and verify for you and say, yeah, it's right. And yes. in, instead of the direct consumer, it's, it's possible, it's, it's a way. Yes. Like the same question uh, I raised this morning about if we gave you the possibility to own your own assets, who, who wants to, to own your own assets and protect your own assets? I'm not sure 100% of people there say, yes, I will keep my money by myself. I, because we need, always need the third party, even yes. when the regulation obliges us. And yes. you, you made an interesting point, is about the recognition about the ash as a legal proof. And uh, we know that in, at, the, at the Federation, we walk into this. And we have proposed to the governments, to the deputies, uh, to make an update about the regulation to recognize, to attribute a clear recognition about the ash as a legal proof. Because if you don't do that, you will always suffer from the use of blockchain technology as a, complete, as, as a complementary solution, not fully autonomous. And we know that it could be a, a, a key issue. Um, and thank you for, for raising these important points. And I think that we we moving into uh, another uh, aspects is related to interoperability. So uh, do you think that, Frank, on your own experience, perhaps on companies you already invested uh, in AI, did they suffer from any trouble regarding interoperability when they use blockchain technology or for AI? Did you already see it? Because it could be a huge issue for the mass adoption of uh, blockchain AI. 
Well, I think that the uh, GNI stuff would uh, help in the interoperability of uh, smart contracts, basically, notably to make it uh, smart. <laughs> uh, saying that the smart contract of today are actually very basic and not that smart. Um, and so uh, potentially we could uh, add a lot of uh, intelligent complexity in the way uh, we define uh, and we code uh, smart contracts. And in terms of interoperability, it could help also to translate those smart contracts into different languages and into uh, different interoperability. So we will see probably uh, interoperability coming um, with with the with the with the with the with the Gen AI uh, era in the development of uh, of smart contract. Um, well, no, that's uh, that's okay. my answer. No, but I would say <laughs> okay. that that is uh, <laughs> you, finally it down. <laughs> uh, I totally agree. I think with AI, uh, interoperability in the blockchain, it's like lots of people speaking. Each of them speak a different language but they all in understand each other. And that's what AI brings to the equation. It's the capability to understand whatever language. And the uh, blockchains have to become uh, interoperable for a mass adoption, absolutely. Uh, I'm very negative about uh, ah, <laughs> interoperability. Tell us. I am a cryptographer, so I have to put trust on uh, the strongest system. And if I have to interoperate a very strong system with a weak system, I will not move my assets from the strong one to the weak one. So the cryptographics, the cryptographer will say, I, I will stay on the stronger system, which fits best my interest. So of course there is there are no smart contract on Bitcoin, so maybe I will use Ethereum, which looks strong. But if you have, I don't know, whatever blockchain, which is ranking uh, 100 uh, with maybe interoperability with Ethereum, maybe you will not go there. Uh, but there is composability, which is different in the same blockchain. So, yeah, yeah. But security-wise, I will not move that easily from one blockchain to the other. Yeah. You're more in uh, to uh, experts that mass market. I don't think in AI is in uh, mass market. So I, I, I agree. No, but it's a long chain. I mean, uh, there is uh, a need for applications with less security and a more a wider more open blockchain and specific blockchains which will never be opened because they will bring the right level of uh, security for a given application. No? That's what you said. M more or less. I'll give you my... As an academic, so I am not industrial, I'm not in a company. I'm trying to think, uh, let's say, academic things which are unbreakable. So I cannot imagine a system which could be weak. So this is, I am biased, okay, you could say. You can keep it, I have a loud voice, no worries. If I may, this technical challenge is very important in Web3. Let's think that tomorrow, every aspect of a life, uh, identities, properties, money, will, will run on Web3 infrastructure, right? So we are in critical systems and the issue of uh, IT security maybe is some sometime underestimated. Okay, blockchain is, is a good technology, but we have to think it at it globally and have continuity plans and have a level of resilience. It's critical systems. We should think about it like tomorrow if we have a problem with internet, how do you do with your with your money, with your pass, with your legal pass? And it's very important. We have to think about it globally. And uh, there is a lot of business to do in terms of uh, security in Web3. I see Ray in the room, but it's very important, very important challenge. And so I understand that you're sceptical. But, uh... <laughs> Maybe there is one uh, convergence, uh, one use case uh, for this conver convergence um, about the, the, the payment between machine. So when those algorithms are going to uh, achieve some, some task, they won't be paid by a credit card, right? Payment system. So I've been working in, in uh, financial services for uh, 20 years now. And I think the existing payment system uh, of today cannot be really translated into uh, the machine to machine uh, payment system. That's exactly what tokens are made for. Paying uh, each other's uh, 
uh, task that will be delivered by those uh, 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 machines with the crypto money, with the transfer of value, uh, and, and uh, that would be a, a kind of, uh, uh, that, that would create a seamless experience in uh, in the, the uh, what you call uh, interoperability of things at some point, between machine to machine. Whatever the uh, adoption rate of, and I do agree, the adoption uh, of a different blockchain uh, through a different wallet, etc., by the population is quite uh, complex, but for a machine it's quite easy. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a, it's a pretty good um, illustration about how using AI for improving the adoption. And you, you raise an important point is about the business model, about tokenomics, because we speak a lot about the, the use cases and the opportunity to go there. But I think if you don't have clear paths about the, the, the real interest of having a specific token for a specific task, I think you can miss something important. And I, I think that, I remember in, at Deep Square you have a specific tokenomics and perhaps you can explain them to illustrate how we can use blockchain technology to merge with AI for HPC as a service. Yeah, absolutely. So we have uh, innovated a lot in terms of tokenomics. Uh, we have taken whatever we learned from the Bitcoin. So we didn't take any risk. I think uh, you have lots of people inventing lots of new ways of thinking things. Wh what we've done is we've analyzed all of those models and we found a tokenomic where which couldn't or shouldn't fail. And the way it works is that whoever uh, gives us some compute power that will resell to the AI community, we give them a token with it, which is non-transferable uh, that is like uh, air miles if you want. So you collect them and every now and then, every 15 days, they can exchange that into true tokens that can be resold. And because of the increase of power, uh, given the fact that the final token is in, uh, limited to 70 million, it pushes to, uh, upwards the price of this token automatically. So it's a self, uh, uh, you call that a, uh, promising prophecy. So the, the, the quicker and the faster the compute power grows, the more the token is worth. And, and uh, it's a metric. With, so, yeah. It's a metric, so it helps companies who provide computational power to be rewarded, but for all the consumers to have a neutral metrics to understood, is there any computational power here in the in this network? How can I monetize it? So I think it's a quite innovative uh, uh, business model. You speak about the, the payment uh, just just before. Yeah, but but uh, I think it is very relevant what you said, Arnaud, and notably uh, I've heard that the 15 billion of investment from Microsoft into open it was also partially uh, some vouchers, right, to consume uh, machine power from Microsoft for free or for uh, those vouchers. So those vouchers are actually in your uh, decentralized approach, is a to your token econo economics. So yeah, that, 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 that could work, definitely. And, and w what we learned during this exercise is that uh, we have created a supply-based tokenomic. That means a AI searcher can pay with, you know, uh, his wallet, but with uh, even his credit card if he wants. That does not impact negatively our tokenomics because the tokenomics is not user-based, it's supply-based. And so it opens to whoever wants to pay and doesn't want to do anything about tokens, about Web3. They understand the blockchain is securing, bringing trust. They don't want to know anything about tokens. They pay with a credit card that has no negative impact on the tokenomics of, uh, of Deepswear. Business model, the, we need to define a right business model because if you invest in something without a good business model, I think you can suffer as an investor. And we need to provide also to investors real answers to the business model of those new companies. When Amazon comes, when all the GAFAM comes, what we used to say, ah, we are not able to properly evaluate them because it's, it's uh, immaterial, it's not material. Previously, the companies uh, was evaluated on base of what they have in terms of real, in reality, in terms of cash treasure, etc. And 
we suffered from the way to analyze the, those new Web2 economy, and we can suffer from it from the Web3. That's why I think that this discussion is really important to educate all the, the, the all the stakeholders of this uh, of this industry. Uh, you want to react about that? No. No. Oh, yeah. I mean, at, at True Global Ventures, we invest in equity, but then we invest in projects that have, at some point, on their roadmap a token economics to be defined or already defined and then uh, a real uh, uh, token uh, approach like uh, uh, token utility in some project in some metaverse project and and and, and others so for uh, for an in investment perspective evaluating the listed token is quite easy because they are priced every day um, we have uh, obviously our own methodology to price on the company uh, equity, but the question we ask ourselves is where is going the value of the company or what part of the uh, value company is going to uh, the token economics. So uh, it's, it's a combination of both. Today we invest in equity. We might get access to some uh, token, but at some point, we invest in what we know. Uh, and voila. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Um, uh, I want to ask you if you really think that we can use AI for blockchain as a service, for Node as a service, to develop the SaaS economy by using AI, but for blockchain-based solution. Do you think that it could be a good way to, uh, to, to to contribute to the adoption of Web3 by using uh, AI for that? Um, uh, actually, Login is a blockchain and we use AI, for instance, to improve the way we assist the users. Uh, for instance, as far as we are concerned uh, with the, the, the building of the, the legal templates. So, so we already use AI, AI bot, to, uh, to improve the, those kind of... Uh, so could be SAS or yes uh, model but but we use it we, we need to be to be clever in terms of of, uh, of the way we, we analyze data so, so uh, AI is already completely integrated in our uh, blockchain model so so yes but there is another way we can use blockchain to, uh, the, the other the other side to use blockchain to help maybe AI to solve some of their problem with the quality of the, the information source. We see it with ChatGPT today. We use ChatGPT, but we, we don't know nothing about the quality of the information. And tomorrow, we will have a high level of automation with automatic decision. But if you are in the army defense industry, or even the law industry, or the money industry, finance, if you have machines that decide and you don't know what is the source of information, you have a problem. Blockchain is a tracking tool. And in terms of traceability, it's just perfect. And we know that the regulators are trying to regulate the infrastructure or the AI. They will never manage to do that. But they can go at the transaction level and, and maybe tokenize all the, the chain of action with AI that lead to an automatic decision. And this token can be maybe either regulated or traced to be sure that someone is responsible for the information source. And that's also a perfect combo between, between AI and, and blockchain. So I don't know if I answered the question. That's yeah, true. I think, Stephanie, you're absolutely right. It's your top on. Uh, on. Um, for whatever sector where data and identity together are key to their success, they need a combination of AI and yeah. blockchain. Yeah. They need the blockchain because the blockchain is, you know, a true data that you can't falsify, you can't yeah. change, you can't take uh, of yeah. the blockchain, and you can construct AI on top of that. So you avoid the issue on ChatGPT being trained on internet, which is 30% uh, yeah. of things that uh, have been invented. So, mm. and it's a mixture of the two where you use true data, but you enhance the data, bringing him intelligence, predictability, yeah. and then you can automatize plenty of processes. And I think of you know, sectors like financial services, yeah. like the supply chain, healthcare, they, they can't take the risk of having the, the wrong AI model built on the wrong or on false data. So they have to use the blockchain and yes. AI together and that will help them optimize all the processes and cut down costs, mm. add uh, some more security and, and more. I already, I already made, uh, asked the question to, to open uh, OpenAI ChatGPT. Yeah. You can do it. Ask to him, right. can I trust you? 
which kind of information, where is the source of your information? And you will see really interesting answers. But Remy, you know what? Listening to you, Arnaud, we should tokenize AI. <laughs> That's a new business. Let's do that together. <laughs> Let's tokenize the world. Thank you so much, uh, experts. Please, uh, warm applause for them. Thank you very much. Now you know, it's your turn. Do you have any question? Yes, perfect, really quick, as an AI. <laughs> Aren't you scared that um, business model that rely on computer power uh, will, um, I mean, go down because of the emission of quantum computer? Yes, you're right. Uh, no, it's obvious that um, at the moment, you know, NVIDIA is creating the most powerful GPUs they can. Uh, they've just announced the H200. It's the best of the world. Uh, but that's nothing compared with what you will have in a few years. Uh, and the, we all know that the Moore law does not apply at all anymore to the electronics because we are too far down the road, uh, but with uh, quantum computing, that will be a revolution, bringing uh, a wealth of uh, power. Uh, absolutely. So, but I think it's a few years down the road. I don't think it will work tomorrow. And there are a few technical challenges still. Yeah, sure. Maybe Daniel. the Web two is uh, more obsolete than the the, the Web three. I would say people are worried about the Web three, but actually the Web two is completely uh, obsolete with those technologies, quantum technologies. So it's been, you know, I have white hair, so it's been maybe thirty years I heard about the quantum computer. Uh, <laughs> maybe in thirty years I will still hear about the upcome of the quantum computer. You have quantum technology for sure. Uh, quantum communication, quantum sensors, uh, uh, quantum cryptography, but quantum computer, it looks very hard. Just, just first, but I, I come to you. Yeah, so I, I have a question regarding uh, how do you see open source, uh, open sourcing all these technologies, quantum computing and AI, uh, to benefit more uh, the advancement of technology. Well, I don't know who wants to take uh, that. Can you rephrase the question, please? I, I didn't get so What do you think about open uh, source, sourcing those technologies? So, yes. On, well, uh, 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 from our you. angle, we see open source as the, the natural way for this ecosystem. We won't do anything without open sources. Whatever we've done, it's open sourced, it's available, and it's a community. And Web3 is a community, open source is a community. So I think it's uh, the end of the old uh, mechanisms and, uh, and ways of selling software. Yeah, the Web3 communities are definitely more willing to uh, adopt the open source uh, stuff. Um, the AI communities, I'm not sure, but that's a debate that they currently have. And notably that the mess we are seeing in ethics and governance on the last two weeks, we had one uh, stepping uh, down from the board uh, of OpenAI. We had one uh, in Binance uh, who had to step uh, down from the, from the governance of the company uh, in, 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 uh, in crypto stuff. So, so I think behind this question of open sourcing and the business model we were talking about, there is a key question, and, and this is our challenge if we want to build a better society, is to combine both uh, technologies, communities, to work together on a better ethics and a better governance of those uh, two emerging uh, technologies. And for AI, look at the success of uh, Hanging Face. Uh, it speaks by itself and the number of uh, stars they have on GitHub. Uh, it's uh, the, the success in AI uh, repository, mo uh, model repository uh, sites with, uh, which shows by itself that all the AI community is going towards uh, this, this direction. Okay, perfect. So like we said in our question, let's beetle. Next question coming just here, sorry. Uh, Casey from Logion. I wanted to get your take on the paradox when you're combining uh, AI and blockchain uh, between the transparency 
of blockchain and the opacity of the algorithm? Uh, can one improve the other or may one discredit the other? So, uh, as just said, you can have uh, open source AI programs, okay, uh, that you can, uh, so you know what's going on when you train them and you know what's going on when you apply them. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, but then, uh, of course, uh, when you use it, uh, it's, not, it's not always explainable. So this means you get a result and you don't know why. So uh, it's uh, an event researcher, so there, there, there is no, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't make sense actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> for instance, I had a PhD student who was trying to combine uh, some crypto and uh, basic uh, machine learning, very naive. And the standard algorithm, it was, he, he had to twist a lot of things to make it work within the crypto framework. So it was deviating a lot from the standard algorithm, but still it worked. So we don't care, it works. Okay. So yes, you could have it open source as you want. Uh, you will not always get explainable AI. Just, just to make it uh, simple, I think it's very emerging. Uh, both technologies, but also uh, two different approach, approaches for the society. And we wish to see uh, that convergence happening, which is not really happening uh, completely. So we are uh, more uh, very uh, theoretical here uh, on what we should see. So we are receiving some uh, uh, deal flow uh, opportunity uh, with the combination of uh, the two technologies. Um, some are very uh, theoretical and very uh, early stage. Some are also people coming from the web two, moving to the web three with, with the, with the uh, acceleration of uh, generating in their uh, stuff. I'll give you just one uh, example of what we are looking at in our GFO on education tech. So education, uh, this is a platform, I will not say the name, but this is a platform made by professors and teachers for kids from two or three to uh, 14 years old, training them on mathematics, English, and, and, and many others. So the contributors are the teachers. Their content is actually basically a kind of NFTs. And then the kids, if I uh, sum it up uh, quickly, can ask for more, to generate more exercise according to the way uh, they are responding to, uh, to, to, to others exercise. So um, they are on a learning curve that the machine, the AI machine understand and, and could generate, customize, personalize and uh, uh, for a, a better uh, learning curve uh, for the kids. So, so education is one of the sectors where you would see uh, gaming educa education where uh, you could see uh, those two technologies. But again, it's very, very new. Uh, in our uh, in our deal flow notably looks like a hot trend because we have another question and it will be the last one please yes thank you um, so I have a general question about proof of work and proof of stake so remember a while ago there was a debate about POS and P, uh, POW and I think I'm not today but I think that POS eventually won at least the PR battle because it uses less energy and it's easier to explain but now with AI and everything, people now understand that it takes computation and energy, well, it takes energy to compute for ChatGPT, et cetera. And so my question is, is, would it be relevant to reopen the debate and maybe proof of stake can be, uh, well, proof of work can maybe better be explained now and uh, maybe for security purposes, uh, some blockchains who are proof of stake may want to become proof of work? Or uh, is it uh, proof of work maybe just only for Bitcoin because the rest is not, doesn't need to be so secure? Uh, uh, my, uh, my view is that proof of work is behind us. Um, coming from the compute, we see exactly what you say. That means uh, when you train GPT-4, it's like uh, the uh, energy you need uh, for uh, Belgium for one year. And people start being very shocked with that. And people say, don't worry, I have a very fancy data center in the Antarctic, but they are, uh, you know, melting the, the bankies, the bankies, the ice. Uh, so 
I think we need to start looking at how much a data center is consuming, burning the atmosphere. And there are plenty of technologies to use renewable energy, green energy, to reuse the, 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 the heat produced by those data centers. Now we have, uh, we have, for example, some partners, they've done data centers in oil, which is uh, cooled down by water, and they reuse the water to warm up a university in Switzerland. So everybody is con uh, Con very conscious now on the uh, use of and the cost of the energy. So I think everything will go that way. And I think what the blockchain brings to us in our project is that you can trace exactly how many uh, you know megawatts a data center has produced. So at the moment, nobody wants to know. But I, I think everybody will have to tell one day. So, so everybody will go through, you know, this exercise on how can I get, you know, ma more compute power with less energy, and how can I prove that? And and I think the proof of stake blockchains will be able to give some exact numbers on the consumptions of those data centers, and that's why uh, and the proof of uh, work is a bit behind us. That's my view. I don't know if uh, there is another view on. That. Maybe I can be a bit provocative. I would say with proof of work, you have security, but you, you it's a waste of energy. And in proof of stake, you don't waste energy, but security. I don't know, uh, maybe uh, some people here are understanding a proof of work, in really understanding. Uh, and I think uh, almost no one, maybe Michele there, which I see, which is a student at the Polytechnic, uh, knows it, but um, yeah, as a uh, journalist say, uh, you have as many kind of proof of stake as French cheese. Uh, it's not always specified, uh, it's vibing a lot. Uh, proof of work is simple and brutal, but it's really strong. Uh, proof of stake, it's not that clear at all. Yeah, that's my computer scientist point of view. Either with proof of law of, or, and with proof of stake, what, what we are missing is the proof of real economy. That's why we invented the proof of law, meaning the proof of responsibility, and have a link between the, the, the hash, the trace, and the economic, uh, economical chain. Proof of law. <laughs> Thank you so much for those answers. Please, applause. Thank you very much.